Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, online session sponsored by Lacuna Diagnostics and in collaboration with the Veterinary Cytology Facebook page. My name is uh, Francesco Chan. I am a clinical pathologist, uh, part of the Lacuna team and also administrator of the Facebook page. The purpose of this online session is to show you an interesting case I received a few weeks ago, but also to provide you the information you need for a step-by-step -step approach to a cytology sample. Let's start with the case. So this was a dog, mixed breed, male, eight years old, that was referred to the veterinarian for a few days' history of anorexia, lethargy, and depression. In the last 24 hours, the dog also developed acute respiratory distress. As part of the diagnostic process, the veterinarian performed X-rays and identified the presence of a large mediastinal mass as you can appreciate from these ventrodorsal and lateral projections. The differential diagnosis that the veterinarian included were tumors, in particular thymoma and lymphoma, but also less common conditions like chemodectoma or ectopic thyroid carcinoma, and then other uh, non-neoplastic conditions, which included a reactive lymph node, a metastatic lymph node, a branchial cyst, or an inflammatory process, in particular an abscess or a granuloma. I'm going now to show you the cytological sample that was digitalized and submitted to my attention. I will guide you through the examination of this smear and we will try together to reach a final diagnosis. This is the slide that was digitalized and submitted to my attention. The first step is always to look at the slide with naked eye and identify and check if there is any material on the slide. As you can see, in this case, there is a lot of material, there is a lot of purple stuff, so the sample is likely going to be highly cellular. But let's go at slightly higher magnification to confirm that. Let's go to 10x. And uh, yes, we can confirm that uh, this sample is highly cellular. And we can also already see that the sample is well preserved. So the cells are intact. They are arranged on a monolayer, on a clear background with some red blood cells. So you should be able to reach a diagnosis, or at least the clinical pathologist should be able to provide you an interpretation to this sample, to this smear. Very important all the time is to have a look at all the smear in every single corner at low power before going at higher magnification. And I'm saying this because very often, especially unexperienced people, have the tendency to go immediately at high magnification when they see something interesting, and then they forget to look at all the slides, and sometimes this might end up in missing important element, important cells. In this case, I can tell you that pretty much every field is similar, so it doesn't make much of a difference. So let's go to slightly higher magnification and let's try to understand which cells we are dealing with. As you can notice, we have a population of cells that look round and look discrete. And they have a quite characteristic, a quite typical morphology that is a lymphoid morphology. I'm saying that because they have a high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. The amount of cytoplasm of these cells is minimal, and most of the cell is actually occupied by nucleus, and this is typical of lymphoid cells. If we also pay attention, we have, in this case, two distinct lymphoid cell populations. We have a main population of intermediate 
two large lymphoid cells that I'm now pointing out with the arrow. And then we have a second population of small lymphocytes. If we do a differential count of 100 cells, and we should do it, especially people that don't have a lot of experience should always perform a differential count in these cases, you will see that the intermediate to large lymphoid cells account for approximately 80 to 85% of all the lymphoid cells. And small lymphocytes are approximately 10-15%. We also have a few other cell types. You might have recognized here a macrophage. You might have recognized a couple of neutrophils, which are likely going to be blood derived. If we look a little bit better at higher magnification at the population of intermediate to large lymphoid cells, we can see that they have a small amount of basophilic cytoplasm, as you can see here. The nucleus is approximately two, sometimes three times the size of a red cell. The chromatin is granular. It's quite pale. We also call it often open chromatin. And sometimes we can also appreciate the presence of nucleoli or at least uh, clamped chromatin. The shape of the nucleus is round, but sometimes it's slightly indented. There is another important element that uh, it's very obvious in this case, and this is the presence of frequent mitotic figures. This is one. Here we have another one. And if we keep looking around, you will see that the number of mitotic figures is really high. So we have definitely more than um, one mitosis per high power field. So overall, we have a main population of intermediate to large lymphoid cells. We have frequent mitotic figures, and these elements are indicative, are compatible with a high-grade large cell lymphoma. We rule out a reactive lymph node because we don't have a mixed population of lymphoid cells with a prevalence of small lymphocytes. And we also rule out a thymoma because in a thymoma we would expect, and I'm going to show you this later on, a mixed population of lymphoid cells, mainly small, and also the presence of epithelial cells, which we do not have in this specific case. Mediastinal lymphoma represents approximately 5% of all lymphomas in the canine species, so a quite small percentage. In terms of clinical signs, it's usually characterized by respiratory signs because uh, we're talking about a space occupying lesion in the thorax, and quite often also PUPD because up to 40% of the dogs with mediastinal lymphoma can also have a paraneoplastic hypercalcemia. Most of the mediastinal lymphomas are large cell lymphomas, as the case we have seen, and they usually are T-cell in origin. It's quite important the differentiation between mediastinal lymphoma and thymoma. And often, with cytology, we are able to differentiate between these tumors. As you can see in this picture uh, that show you a good, a nice case of uh, thymoma, you can see that uh, we have two different cell populations. We have a population of uh, lymphoid cells, mainly small lymphs, and those are expected because the thymus is actually a lymphoid organ. And then we have a population of epithelial cells, which are the neoplastic component. Unfortunately, in thymoma, the epithelial cells are not always present, are not always visible, either because they do not exfoliate upon aspiration or because we are dealing with a lymphocyte-rich thymoma. In those dubious cases, additional investigation are recommended, and these include histopathology, flow cytometry, or PAR testing. 
but why it's so important the differentiation between mediastinal lymphoma and thymoma? The reason is because the treatment is different and the prognosis is different too. Thymoma are usually approached with surgical excision and based on the literature, the median survival time is over two years. And actually, the majority of the cases from these studies died for causes different from thymoma. In case of lymphoma, usually the approach is a multi-agent chemotherapy protocol, often CHOP, and based on the literature, the median survival time is much lower. Based on a paper from Moore from 2017, the overall survival time was 194 days. I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, short presentation. I can tell you that there will be more presentation coming in the next weeks. I want to thank uh, Lacuna and all the Lacuna team, all the pathologists, the clinical pathologists that work with Lacuna. And uh, I invite you, obviously, to keep an eye on our page for more cases to come. Thank you.